Educational consultant and specializes in the promotion of positive school climate and prevention of bullying and harassment in school settings and program evaluation. Uh, we've heard him speak multiple times. We are very pleased and honored to have him here with us. So, um, after he speaks, we're actually just going to break up into groups and do a quick breakout session, have, um, have dessert as well. So, that'll be great.
can be very powerful. Uh, it was actually something I saw in the Today Show a long time ago, actually only a month ago, um, not very long, about a school that had had, had this kind of viral uh, social media incident in school, and here's what it was. It was, it caught on in a viral fashion that everyone was going to use Twitter to send compliments to people unsolicited in their school. What's funny about it is it went viral. And imagine if I walk into that school in a suit and tie and I say, hey kids, I got an idea. Let's all send compliments to each other on Twitter. That is going to go nowhere. I promise you it's going to go nowhere. Because I've spent numerous times trying to get ideas that I thought were great, watch them go nowhere. As parents, we probably, we probably shared that experience. And what it was was an organic, student-initiated groundswell. It was a tipping point. It was a political movement. And it was the kind of thing that really altered the culture in the school. So at the end of the period of time where this was happening, even as it started to slow down, what you saw in that school were when, when different types, and as you know, schools typically are dealing with a more negative Twitter feeds and Instagram, et cetera, is that when things like that happened in this school, students were saying, that's not what we do at our school. That's not what we do at our school. And I will tell you from the schools I'm in, it's usually the adults that are having to say, that's not the kind of picture you can post in our school. And it was the norms being generated and created by the students themselves that was the most powerful intervention. So I really want to talk to you today about how we, and as teachers, and administrators, and parents, and students, who I'm thrilled to see there are students here too, can work together to generate some of this own groundswelling here in our Northampton schools. So I'm going to tell you about a middle school that we worked with that identified using student surveys, and they were written by students, they were administered by students, they were analyzed by students, who had determined that sixth graders entering this middle school were terrified. Not surprising. Seventh grade was great, eighth grade was great, in fact, the second half of sixth grade was great too. It was a good school, but sixth graders were terrified. And this group of students had to come up with a solution to solve this problem. Now, there are a lot of great solutions out there. They came up with one that um, other schools have used in the past. Um, how many of you have heard of a backpack program? Backpack program, you get a school backpack, you fill it up with all this kind of cool schools, stuff, and you give it to the sixth graders on the first day, and the students do. And it's very friendly, engaging, neat kind of thing. And so a teacher came up with this. Let's do a backpack day. A teacher wrote a grant, and they did a backpack day. Well, what a wonderful idea, except the students kind of looked at this teacher, and I was there, and they said, you know, that's great, backpacks are nice, but let's do it a little bit differently. And so they got into this discussion. And it went about like this. The student says, why don't, we, why don't we go to the elementary schools and deliver the backpacks ourselves in groups and tell them about our school? So they added a new element. And then they said, why, why are we just doing backpacks? Why don't we do, let's, let's use alliteration. You didn't use alliteration. Uh, let's use a little backpack and barbecue. Let's have a barbecue. And the beauty of the school in question is that what they were doing was empowering students to make decisions. And obviously, not all decisions can be made by students, but in this case, backpack, backpacks and barbecue sounded pretty good. And then they threw a very funny requirement. You know, the students have gotten some, I think they're rolling along at this point. They said, yeah, and one more rule. The teachers have to wear shorts. And I remember the adults in the room, you know, it's like, okay, backpack's great, we can, we can afford backpacks. Barbecue, uh, going to the schools, okay, we need bus, we need transportation allowances, et cetera, permission forms, you know, they're solving all those problems. And all of a sudden, now they have to, according to the student leaders, require their teachers to wear shorts. And none of the adults understood why, why. And one of the girls said, we've never seen these teachers in anything but their school attire. If they come in their regular attire, we think that they're there to teach us. We want to see them there 
messing around and sitting on the grass at our barbecue. That's what they wanted to see. And what they were saying was, they want the fifth graders to see the teachers as real people, real members of the community, and have an impression of them that fell outside of the typical. And this was the student's idea. So this backpack and barbecue program um, did very well. Did very well. And you know what? It would be an idea any one of us or many of us might have thought of. But the organicity with which it happens, the process, really is the power. And I want to reference you know, a very common metaphor, the notion of the iceberg, and remind us as adults that um, we don't see everything. And if we think we see everything, we're missing a lot. Kids don't see everything either. You've probably seen all these really excellent posters around the school which are exposing the real beliefs that people have that are often subject to misunderstanding. People often misunderstand the extent to which other people may drink alcohol, misunderstand the extent to which other people may be involved in various activities. And clarifying these public norms brings this iceberg out of the water. And as adults, we are often faced with this challenge of solving really, really big problems. And they feel so big, it's hard to imagine that, that we could involve community members, we could involve students. And one other thing I will tell you is the very process of involving students is in itself an intervention. You have started the ball rolling when you bring that to the table. The very process of involving parents, the very process of broadening out the notion of who should be at the table when we are starting to address this issue really comes to the forefront. Uh, you start in your intervention when you really talk about who's going to be there. So, you know, Marisa really uh, showed some interesting slides. I'm going to talk about them uh, in a little bit, um, because they're important for us to understand. One of the things about social climate, if you just think about the history, you know, for, uh, I'll characterize far too much history in far too little time, but, you know, there was the boys will be boys, girls will be girls era, and now we have, and then that covered a lot of our childhood, unfortunately, and um, then we have, you know, kind of like the notion of really starting to appreciate uh, the role that drugs and sex and alcohol and bullying can play in schools and how to address them and racism and sexism and homophobia and starting to bring those to the schools. And, you know, the anti-bullying notion was something that I have always sought to replace with a, uh, with more positive language. Pro-school climate. So that if we can tackle school climate, we're actually tackling lots of problems at the same time. That, in, and again, from my clinical background, it, it is another model with parenting that if you spend more time modeling and helping kids understand what they should be doing, you'll do less time telling them what not to do. And being in a pro-social climate activist, being somebody that looks at the climate in your school and tries to address it, is really an intervention in and of itself. So, now, Marisa's data showed, and it's something I'm going to replicate here, that school climate is a vehicle for academic and social success. Um, we did research in Tennessee. Um, Tennessee, we have a huge uh, group of schools working together. And by the way, Tennessee went on, uh, Tennessee, has, Tennessee has some big problems we've got there, but they went on to be one of the first two states to get raised to the top funding uh, in this country based on a lot of things that they did in looking at their climate. Um, and the feds have responded with national climate standards. And so even though these necessarily aren't taught on MCAS, what we know is that a school's climate is predictive of that school's outcome. So one of the wonderful things that you can do as teachers, administrators, and parents is all of the work that you put into your community, whether it's being part of the PTO, whether it's being uh, involved in local governance, whether it's uh, being a parent, who uh, sends back a permission form in time, whatever it may be, you are contributing to a positive school climate that our research tells us accounts for about 11% of untapped academic achievement. And if you think about 11%, it's pretty 
it seems like a small number, but I'll tell you that most evidence-based inter, uh, interventions that are designed to address a problem don't hit that number. You know, we're looking for 5% improvements, incremental improvements. 11% is quite significant. And so what that means that I can tell schools, and tell people, and tell parents is that if you can address some of the climate problems in your school and do nothing else, buy no new books, don't change class sizes, uh, don't do any new reading interventions, no professional development, if you can positively address the climate in your school, you're going to see bump up in all of those other places. And it's an amazing thing to really think of because so often we are caught thinking that we have to choose one thing or the other. School climate is one of those places where we can choose everything by looking at one thing. It's a pretty powerful notion. So I like to remind us, by the way, that school climate reflects adult culture. I mean, these, these are um, adult problems in kids' bodies. And we as adults, not that I'm blaming us, but it's our society. A school reflects a society. Now, it is, it is its own entity, and every school is its own entity. I like to think of a school district uh, as being a flotilla of boats that are all going the same direction. The wind blows them all in a similar fashion, but they go at different speeds, they're different sizes, they have a different crew. Um, they don't always get to the same place at the same time. Um, I have a boat analogy about parenting, which I'll maybe save um, for later. But the notion that there's a problem with our schools. The notion that we hear about school shootings or we hear about mental health issues in schools and that there's something wrong with our schools. It's not really a fair notion. I don't personally think it's an accurate notion. What it is, is we're seeing the same problem that we deal with and address as adults in adult society played out in the society of children. And so it's not really about assigning blame. It's about working together. And, you know, I really like to try to bring together the notion that that there's, uh, that there's two spheres here, and really start to think of it as one. So, when we think about this vehicle for academic and social success, we think about it as it can drive a lot of different ways. It can go a lot of different directions. Uh, one of the things I really like about this community is that I'm very much, um, you know, I love this community. I'm very much politically in tune with this community. When I was in Tennessee, I wasn't always in tune with community in Tennessee, and I will tell you that uh, that makes a difference, because politics plays, plays out in climate, the kind of laws you have plays out in climate. You know, in, in Tennessee we saw changes in uh, how they responded to their children, the changes were disproportionately better for all federally protected categories, all of gender, race, religion but not better in the non-federally protected, sexual orientation, body size, for example, percentage of geekness, or whatever it may be, whatever characteristics that might be there. The protections that we have in place do us good. And you know, even though I am a pro-climate guy, I'm also uh, appreciative of the importance of things like the bullying law for that perspective. Now, to borrow something from medicine, school climate is the bedside manner of medicine. You know, research has shown, uh, interestingly enough, that one of the most significant predictors in positive health outcomes is how much you like your doctor. Anyone know that? It comes in all different kind of flavors, too. The doctors who are more likely to get sued are not the ones who made the errors. They're the ones with the poorer bedside manner. And part of the reason is because a good side bedside manner means a good relationship. And a good relationship withstands a lot of stress. And so if we can promote this in our schools, we're going to withstand stress. We're going to withstand stress when it comes uh, tax time, when it comes override time, when our kids are not quite getting what we want them to get out of math class, or we as teachers are not quite getting what we need out of our parents uh, for whatever other issue we're facing. So, I wanted to just kind of share some broader notions. I'm certainly going to leave questions, uh, room for questions. In fact, anyone who has a question can ask them at any time, but I'll leave room at the end. And I want to encourage you to think about how you might break out into your breakout groups to discuss some of these issues, because how can we get 
families and schools and teens working together. The first thing I want to really uh, encourage us to do is to shift away from the my job, your job mentality. And a lot of times, the way we break down stressful situations is to really think about what's, our, what's my job, what's your job. And I was actually in a school uh, just today, not, not a Northampton school, where there was a student really, really struggling. And everyone in the room, understand, was trying to figure out what is my job? Who's teaching reading? Who's working on working memory? Who's calling the doctor, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a practical utility to doing that, of course. But we have to break out of this my job, your job. This idea that if somebody else isn't doing their job, that you should sit there and wait until they've done their job. Or the idea that um, you have no power to have a positive impact on something that's not really in your sphere. And come back to this uh, uh, caught off guard group. You know, I'll bet you have, you will find out, but you probably have no idea exactly how many people you will help by just having that message out there. Having those children hear messages from older kids who've been there. And so we have to really get out of this notion. I see this a lot in uh, meetings between teachers and parents. I see this a lot sometimes in the news. And the, the idea that we are one community, we can work together, and in fact, we have to work together, and a lot of times we're desperate to work together, and that's okay. It's okay to feel that sense of dependence on your school and your teachers, and a sense of dependence on your fellow parents and your friends, because we are interdependent. We can't do this all by ourselves. So I really try to encourage you to, to avoid that kind of thinking. Now, um, Timur Saracen, an educational scholar, describes something called the predictable failure of educational reform. And it kind of gets into what I'm going to talk today about student leadership. And it goes something like this. Very large scale study, he did what's called a meta analysis, which is looking at hundreds, possibly thousands of studies, and all different types of methodologies and results and trying to pull out all the places where they were similar and try to make apples to apples comparisons. And here's what he found. What he found was that um, the school-based and community-based interventions that were the most effective always had one significant component, and that is they altered the power structures. They altered the power structures. And he wrote a book about it called, um, the, you know, Avoiding a Predictable Failure of Educational Reform. And that is, roughly speaking, in layman's terms, do whatever you want. But if you don't address the power structure, the problem's going to come back. That's a way of saying it. And then that's not blaming the people in power. What that is talking about is broadening who is in power. And the more ideas that are at the table, in a community can be very valuable. And so he really encouraged us to avoid this predictable failure. One of the ways I've interpreted that in my work is to be certain that student leaders are included in the work in schools. Now, how do you get students to be uh, involved? And one of the things that I will talk to you about is some of the ways we've done that in the past. The promotion of engagement is an intervention. It is not a sideshow. And it's not a side effect. And I even think, you know, Marisa showed some slides that basically showed students who rated themselves as more or less engaged had different outcomes. And roughly speaking, the slides show that as engagement increased, mental health and social problems went up and grades went down. Does that surprise you? It doesn't surprise me. Um, we have to figure out how to promote engagement. That is an intervention. If we change that, we will see those numbers alter. And so a lot of times what happens when we see those numbers is we, we think about like what causes what. And if we get caught in the trap of blaming students for not being engaged and not trying to wonder what we can do to get them engaged, we really miss the point. And this is part of what I would hope to encourage you to do today. So when we work with schools, one of the things we do is look for student leadership. And there are already in 
embedded structures for student leadership all around. And when it comes to school climate, having those student leaders is extremely valuable. I will just say that the embedded structures for student leadership in most schools also have embedded in them the biases and problems of that school climate. And so one of the dangers that I've seen is, you know, when we think of student leaders is we say, um, who wants to be a student leader? And the people who raise their hand to the people who are typically student leaders or are socially adept enough to be student leaders or are um, courageous enough to stand in front of people. In fact, we know, this is really interesting, we know that so-called introverts, people who don't like to be in front of others, have an entirely different set of talents and skills to lend to organizations that often get missed because the, uh, their opportunity to be in leadership positions usually means holding a microphone. And so we have to think carefully about replicating our problems by taking existing structures without shaking things up a little bit. And so one of the things that we would do is we would recruit student leaders and we would encourage them to gather their own data. I don't want to get, go too far down the rabbit hole of methodology, but I'm local, so we can talk about methodology another time if you like. But go down the rabbit hole, going down the rabbit hole a bit, to gather data about their school, to analyze data about their school, to present data about their school. And you know what? If kids are doing surveys, then occasionally they make fart jokes on the survey. How do you get them not to do that? You get them to buy into the surveys by having them administered and led by other students. That's how you get them to buy in. And you do it anonymously so that you can uh, limit uh, the, the, that kind of potential for embarrassment, et cetera. And in so doing, students can then bring to power, to bear, the power of understanding what these data mean. Um, here's what we found that is really interesting. Um, we found that what makes a good school uh, can kind of depend on who you ask, as you're, you know, not be surprised to know. Um, and so the first thing, I love that we're in a lunchroom, right? Because I think our campus does a great job about thinking about diversity, but the way very few schools can conceptualize an additional level of diversity, what I call lunchroom diversity, and that is every table in the lunchroom. Um, if you are looking to bring students to uh, leadership positions, you have to have every table in the lunchroom represented. And do you want to know who's the most important? <laughs> the unengaged students need to be represented. And that's kind of a brain warp, isn't it? You know, that you want to try to find a leader of the unengaged students. I will tell you that unengaged students aren't uniformly interested in staying unengaged. Many of them have an explanation or a reason why they're unengaged. And the opportunity to be empowered and to place themselves in a position to see change in their school can be extremely valuable and important. So I really want to encourage people to look for that. The other bias that we think is that when we go to school events, they're often lovely. Graduations are wonderful, football games, prom, special events, fundraisers, bake sales. And so the key thing that we have to do is we have to look around and say, who's missing? I've worked with a lot of schools who were, um, uh, to put it bluntly, annoyed that I was there. Because I was, in some cases, I was there because um, the state or the superintendent told them that they had to bring in somebody like me or um, someone who works in the school climate. And they often fell victim to this bias because at graduation, they would look around and see the unbelievably positive relationships they had with their students, the unbelievable outcomes, the, the, the love and appreciation between students and teachers. But the people who weren't there were the students who dropped out were the students who didn't make it, were the students who didn't feel engaged, and they're not there to voice. And so looking for who's not there is another key. And when you're a parent 
uh, in a parent group, or you're a teacher starting a student organization, or you're a student looking for things to do, we've got to find out who's not here, and how do we get them here? What are the ideas that we can have to pull broad? Because what are the, one of the things we found, we asked hundreds of questions to elementary school kids and middle school kids and high school kids about school climate. And of course, when you do that, you can use all these fancy statistics to try to figure out which questions are good and which questions are bad, and then you continue to make your survey better and better. But we continued bumping into this thing with the elementary schools, which was funny, that we could never get a truly valid survey. And what that means is that no matter what we ask students, their um, elementary kids, their, their responses were kind of all over the board. So it looked like this mindless scatter. We didn't know, like, do they not read well enough to do a survey? Do they not like the survey? What's going on? Well, it turned out that elementary kids have a very, very simple view of school climate, and there was one question that accounted for almost all of their feeling about school climate. And guess what that one question was? I like recess, no. Um, I like my school on a zero to five. That's it. Elementary school children can titrate the entire political, socio-political, economic, cultural, and gender aspects of social climate into a simple question. I like my school. And you know what? If the majority of elementary school kids like their school, then our research tells us that your school is doing okay. And if you're almost like a line, right? Now, high school is much different. It does not work that way in high school, but there's some fascinating, uh, wonderful things about high school students, because they can understand the socio-political. They can understand issues about race and gender and religion, uh, and sexual orientation, bias. Um, they can recognize the difference between a teacher who's good at differentiating his or her instructional side, uh, style from one who's not. And so, the high school students would give us very meaningful scatter. That makes sense? And so, they, weren't, they were scattered, but not all over the place. And we could see patterns. We could look at a high school and we could say, okay, this school has a problem with how boys treat girls, or this school has a problem with um, Kids not feeling like they have enough choices. By the way, choices, that's another piece of engagement. Do kids have choices? And the piece of the data that really stood out the most with high school students that held most things together was it didn't matter if there was, um, if a student identified certain problems in the school, like, oh, the math department's bad, or gosh, the, there's a sexist undertone here. That mattered but not as much as a different variable, which was, um, there's a place for me to belong here. There's a place for me to belong here. High school students could take the good with the bad if they had a place where they could belong. And what is that? That is your key to engagement, creating places where everyone can belong. And I will tell you that if you can do that, as parents and as educators, community members, then you're going to see changes in climate because we all need to feel like we fit in. And that is really what it's all about. The problems that can get solved by that piece of it um, are really profound. Finding a place for everyone to belong. Now, I used to do interviews at the end of every year. I work with schools for years at a time. I, work, I do interviews with the kid at the end of every year, and you know, the student leaders worked really hard. And at the end of the year, sometimes at the beginning, I would do these little interviews and ask them, you know, why did you become a school leader? And they would give me all sorts of great examples. Oh, some of them, you know, would make you cry. They would talk about instances of bullying that they wanted to just, uh, some of them were more innocuous, like, oh, I just like my school, I want to help out. You know, you see future politicians, you see future artists, you'd, be, you'd see athletes in there. And, um, There'd be all sorts of reasons why they would do it. And I was just always interested to hear, and there were differences between elementary and middle school. And so one year, it was about five years into a project I was working at uh, in a district. Uh, so I was working with about 30 schools, elementary, middle, and high school. And I was talking to some high school kids, some uh, high school kids, I think it was like six years in, some freshmen, and I literally almost like by rote, 
I kind of pulled out my little audio recorder and I said, um, so can I ask you some questions? And sure. Um, so can you tell me, why did you decide to become a student leader? And they looked at me and they said, I've always been a student leader. And I realized that these high school students had become student leaders in elementary school, stuck with it through middle, stuck with it through high school. So in elementary, they said, oh, I want to be a helpful person. But in high school, they were saying, this is part of who I am. I'm a leader. I'm a student leader. And this particular school, the team was called the Respect and Leadership Team. So this was uh, very much around climate and respect. And here's the funny thing that happened, is the elementary schools got better quicker, and the high school schools, the high schools got better at a bit of a lag. And the reason was because the inculcation of that leadership and respect model in the elementary school fed up. And so when those kids went to middle school, middle school got better. When those kids went to high school, high school got better. And you saw this kind of beautiful cross um, fostering of, of an attitude and shift. And some of the concrete programs that had been put into place were still there, they had become institutions. And so, as you're thinking about what's going on in your schools, I will tell you this. Anyone who does work with school climate will walk into Northampton schools and see lots of wonderful things. And I could easily say many more wonderful things than might be in other districts. And so there's nothing broken here. But what it really is about is how can we how can we get to that final space where we are constantly walking back and forth between the community mentality, the school mentality, the parent mentality, the youth mentality. Work together. And find, find our sweet spot when it comes to climate. And you're doing great work already, I can, I can tell you that. And um, maybe I'm preaching in the choir here because here's an engaged group of people. Um, but I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about this. And um, I think that is the end of what I have to say formally. But I wanted to give you a couple minutes, well, even before breakout, to give you a chance to ask questions um, that we'd be happy to answer uh, about any of the things I've said. That is one of the fundamental questions. 
Yeah. Can kids ask each other that question in a survey or not? Yeah, they can. Actually, I've seen it. One of the ways that I've seen it asked, you can ask a number of ways. Um, if, if I need help as a teacher in this school, then I feel comfortable approaching. You know, or um, I have a group of friends that I share uh, my deep, deep problems with, for example. And so there are different levels, ways you can belong. There are clubs. I'm a member of a club in my school, right? What percentage of people say yes tells you what percentage uh, have access to something like that. So that's a multifaceted question um, that you can explode out into lots of different domains, some of which may be related to your school, the things that you know about your school. For example, everyone may be in a club. Right, then, and then so you then the kids, let's say, give a survey. Mm -hmm. They collect the data, they publish the data, and then it's sort of up to who the kids will participate in figuring out how to bring more people in. Yeah, well, I think, I, I don't want to jump too far down on the how-tos, because it's, there's a lot of steps in between, but like the overall process that you're talking about is kind of like an organically generated data gathering tool that is then organically um, uh, examined and validated and then thoughtfully published or not published, thoughtfully used. So I can't say it's as simple as just like writing the questions, giving it out, and then publishing it. But what we're talking about here is a process where the student leadership component is most effective when they're engaged in the very beginning. Yeah. Well, I, I guess I wanted to just add that you know we just did uh, a large, extensive survey yeah. uh, in well in all of the county, including the Kansas high school. So that would be a good starting point if you have yeah. like data that will already be accessible by the end of the summer. Yeah. That you, data you already have, have you can already look at. Right. And so on the one hand, I understand yeah. we want the students to engage with it, and that's that yeah. process in and of itself is useful. And we will have data that is going to be very current that will be a good mm -hmm. starting jumping off point. You don't have to ask necessarily the same kind of questions. But yeah. The students don't often get to really see that data. Yeah, and the, 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 you have you have to understand what the problems are. You have to understand what the solutions are. And so you take a take a parenting example, you know, uh, where you might ask your son or daughter, um, "We always get in fights when I tell you this. I'm do your homework. I'm at a loss. Can you help me figure out the best way to ask you to do your homework? Do you like reminders? Like, do you want?" To do it on, you know, like help me understand. So there's another level of student engagement is when you identify a problem. Because sometimes the problems are identified by people outside the school. Like if your dropout rate is too high or too or not too high. I mean too high. I was going to say too high or too low. Um, that you have known problems, and then you go to students for the solutions. So at least be engaged in part of that. Yeah. Question back there. Yeah, yeah. How to get those kids involved? Yeah, <clears throat> the first thing, when I'm working with a group of students, uh, the first thing I will ask them is who's missing? And um, first of all, you know, it, I may have some good ideas of the types of people who might be missing. Um, and the types of people who might typically not be thought of. You know, you might have um, a kid who does really well in school, but has never come to any school function. That's a type of kid who might be missing. Why is that kid never coming to a school function? We should find that out. Um, so the very first question I ask, I ask the students who's missing. Um, I also have to go in with a pretty good working knowledge if I'm an administrator. Um, about the, the various categories that are represented in my school. Like I need to know about the socioeconomic status and the breakdown of, of my school and how that looks and racial and ethnic differences and religious differences. Knowing about my community is really instructive. Um, knowing but the norms, you know, the, the, the slang, the lingo, uh, I won't always know that. And I rely on kids to tell me that. Is that helpful? Yeah. And then you know what? Personal invitations. Like, we need you. Like, the personal invitation goes a long way. That is an intervention. If you're a kid who's never been engaged in anything, and you get a personal invitation from the assistant principal to be part of the leadership team, even if you say no, 
your perspective on that school is different and change. So anyway. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to give it to Marisa to talk about the breakout groups. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we are actually just serving up dessert. So a couple things. Um, if you'd like to get dessert, and then whatever color your agenda is, is where you are going to go for your breakout group. It does not coordinate with the tablecloth color. <laughs> I didn't realize that when I did this episode. It coordinates with the color that your breakout group facilitator has. We'll work it out though. We'll, we'll figure it all out. So your first group will be waving. I'm the pink 